Segment 4. Published by ThoughtAudio.com All these principles appear to men who regard them from the standpoint of a lower conception of life as the expression of an impulsive enthusiasm having no direct application to life. These principles, however, follow from the Christian theory of life just as logically as the principles of paying a part of one's private gains to the commonwealth and of sacrificing one's life in defense of one's country follow from the state theory of life. As the man of the state conception of life said to the savage, Reflect, bethink yourself. The life of your individuality cannot be true life, because that life is pitiful and passing. But the life of a society in succession of individuals, family, clan, tribe, or state, goes on living. And therefore a man must sacrifice his own individuality for the state of the family or the state. In exactly the same way, the Christian doctrine says to the man of the social state conception of life, Repent ye, that is, bethink yourself, or you will be ruined. Understand that this casual personal life, which now comes into being and tomorrow is no more, can have no permanence, that no external means, no construction of it, can give it consecutiveness and permanence. Take thought and understand that the life you are living is not real life. The life of the family, of society, of the state will not save you from annihilation. The true, the rational life is only possible for man according to the measure in which he can participate. Not in the family or the state, but in the source of life, the father, according to the measure in which he can merge his life in the life of the father such as undoubtedly the Christian conception of life, visible in every utterance of the gospel. One may not share this view of life. One may reject it. One may show its inaccuracy and its erroneousness. But we cannot judge the Christian teaching without mastering this view of life. Still less can one criticize a subject on a higher plane from a lower point of view. From the basement, one cannot judge the effect of the spire but this is just what the learned critics of the day try to do, for they share the erroneous idea of the orthodox believers that they are in possession of certain infallible means of investigating the subject. They fancy if they apply their so-called scientific methods of criticism, there can be no doubt of their conclusion being correct. This testing the subject by the fancied infallible method of science is the principal obstacle to understanding the Christian religion for unbelievers, for so-called educated people. From this, follow all the mistakes made by scientific men about the Christian religion, and especially two strong misconceptions which, more than everything else, hinder them from a correct understanding of it. One of these misconceptions is that the Christian moral teaching cannot be carried out and that therefore it has either no force at all, that is, it should not be accepted as the rule of conduct, or it must be transformed, adapted to the limits within which its fulfillment is possible in our society. Another misconception is that the Christian doctrine of love of God, and therefore of His service, is an obscure, mystic principle, which gives no definite object for love, and should therefore be replaced by the more exact and comprehensible principles of love for men and the service of humanity. The first misconception in regard to the impossibility of following the principle is the result of men of the state conception of life unconsciously taking that conception as the standard by which the Christian religion directs men and taking the Christian principle of perfection as the rule by which that life is to be ordered. They think and say, that to follow Christ's teaching is impossible because the complete fulfillment of all that is required by this teaching would put an end to life. If a man were to carry out all that Christ teaches, he would destroy his own life. And if all men carried it out, then the human race would come to an end, they say. If we take no thought for the morrow, what we shall eat and what we shall drink, and wherewithal we shall be clothed, do not defend our life not resist evil by force, lay down our life for others, and observe perfect chastity, the human race cannot exist, they say. And they are perfectly right 
if they take the principle of perfection given by Christ's teaching as a rule which everyone is bound to fulfill. Just as in the state principles of life, everyone is bound to carry out the rule of paying taxes, supporting the law, and so on. The misconception is based precisely on the fact that the teaching of Christ guides men differently from the way in which the precepts founded on the lower conception of life guide men. The precepts of the state conception of life only guide men by requiring of them an exact fulfillment of rules or laws. Christ's teaching guides men by pointing them to the infinite perfection of their Heavenly Father, to which every man independently and voluntarily struggles, whatever the degree of his imperfection in the present. The misunderstanding of men who judge of the Christian principle from the point of the view of the state principle consists in the fact that on the supposition that the perfection which Christ points to can be fully attained. They ask themselves, just as they ask the same question on the supposition that state laws will be carried out, what will be the result of all this being carried out? Because the perfection held up to Christians is infinite and can never be attained. And Christ lays down His principle, having in view the fact that absolute perfection can never be attained but that striving toward absolute, infinite perfection will continually increase the blessedness of men, and that this blessedness may be increased to infinity thereby. Christ is not teaching angels, but men, living and moving in the animal life. And so, to this animal force of movement, Christ, as it were, applies the new force, the recognition of divine perfection, and thereby directs the movement by the resultant of these two forces. To suppose that life is going in the direction to which Christ pointed it is just like supposing that a little boat afloat on a rabid river and directing its course almost exactly against the current will progress in that direction. Christ recognizes the existence of both sides of the parallelogram, of both external, indestructible forces of which the life of man is compounded, the force of his animal nature and the force of the consciousness of the kinship to God. Saying nothing of the animal force which asserts itself remains always the same and is therefore independent of human will. Christ speaks only of the divine force, calling upon a man to know it more closely, to set it more free from all that retards it, and to carry it to a higher degree of intensity. In the process of liberating, of strengthening this force, the true life of man, according to Christ's teaching, consists. The true life, according to preceding religions, consists in carrying out rules, the law. According to Christ's teaching, it consists in an ever closer approximation to the divine perfection held up before every man, and recognized within himself by every man in an ever closer and closer approach to the perfect fusion of his will and the will of God, that fusion toward which man strives and the attainment of which would be the destruction of the life we know. The divine perfection is the asymptote of human life, to which it is always striving and always approaching, though it can only be reached in infinity. The Christian religion seems to exclude the possibility of life only when men mistake the pointing to an ideal as the laying down of a rule. It is only then that the principles presented in Christ's teaching appear to be destructive of life. These principles, on the contrary, are the only ones that make true life possible. Without these principles, true life could not be possible. One ought not to expect so much, is what people usually say in discussing the requirements of the Christian religion. One cannot expect to take absolutely no thought for the morrow, as it is said in the Gospel, but only not to take too much thought for it. One cannot give away all to the poor, but one must give away a certain definite part. One need not aim at virginity, but one must avoid debauchery. One need not forsake wife and children, but one must not give too great a place to them in one's heart, and so on. But to speak like this is just like telling a man who is struggling on a swift river and is directing his course against the current that it is impossible to cross the river rowing against the current and that to cross it, he must float in the direction of the point he wants to reach. In reality, in order to reach the place he wants to go, 
he must row with all his strength toward a point much higher up. To let go the requirements of the ideal means not only to diminish the possibility of perfection, but to make an end of the ideal itself. The ideal that has power over men is not an ideal invented by someone, but the ideal that every man carries within his soul. Only this ideal of complete infinite perfection has power over men and stimulates them to action. A moderate perfection loses its power of influencing men's heart. Christ's teaching only has power when it demands absolute perfection, that is, the fusion of the divine nature, which exists in every man's soul with the will of God, the union of the Son with the Father. Life according to Christ's teaching consists of nothing but this setting free of the Son of God, existing in every man, from the animal, and in bringing him closer to the Father. The animal existence of a man does not constitute human life alone. Life according to the will of God only is also not human life. Human life is a combination of the animal life and the divine life. And the more this combination approaches to the divine life, the more life there is in it. Life according to the Christian religion is a progress toward the divine perfection. No one condition, according to this doctrine, can be higher or lower than the other. Every condition, according to this doctrine, is only a particular stage, of no consequence in itself, on the way toward unattainable perfection, and therefore in itself, it does not imply a greater or lesser degree of life. Increase of life, according to this, consists in nothing but the quickening of the progress toward perfection, and therefore the progress toward perfection of the publican Zacchaeus, of the woman that was a sinner, and of the robber on the cross, implies a higher degree of life than the stagnant righteousness of the Pharisee. And therefore, for this religion, there cannot be rules which it is obligatory to obey. The man who is at a lower level but is moving onward toward perfection is living a more moral, a better life, is more fully carrying out Christ's teaching than the man on a much higher level of morality who is not moving onward toward perfection. It is in this sense that the lost sheep is dearer to the Father than those who were not lost. The prodigal son, the piece of money lost and found again were more precious than those that were not lost. The fulfillment of Christ's teaching consists in moving away from self toward God. It is obvious that there cannot be definite laws and rules for this fulfillment of the teaching. Every degree of perfection and every degree of imperfection are equal in it. No obedience to laws constitutes a fulfillment of this doctrine, and therefore, for it, there can be no binding rules and laws. From this fundamental distinction between the religion of Christ and all preceding religions based on the state conception of life follows a corresponding difference in the special precepts of the state theory and the Christian precepts. The precepts of the state theory of life insist for the most part on certain practical prescribed acts by which men are justified and secure of being right. The Christian precepts the commandment of love is not a precept in the strict sense of the word, but the expression of the very essence of the religion, are the five commandments of the Sermon on the Mount, all negative in character. They show only what at a certain stage of development of humanity men may not do. These commandments are, as it were, signposts on the endless road to perfection, toward which humanity is moving, showing the point of perfection which is possible at a certain period in the development of humanity. Christ has given expression in the Sermon on the Mount to the eternal ideal toward which men are spontaneously struggling, and also the degree of attainment of it to which men may reach in our times. The ideal is not to desire to do ill to anyone, not to provoke ill will, to love all men. The precept showing the level below which we cannot fall in the attainment of this ideal, is the prohibition of evil speaking, and that is the first command. The ideal is perfect chastity, even in thought. The precept, showing the level below which we cannot fall in the attainment of this ideal, is that of purity of married life, avoidance of debauchery. That is a second command. 
The ideal is to take no thought for the future, to live in the present moment. The precept showing the level below which we cannot fall is the prohibition of swearing, of promising anything in the future, and that is the third command. The ideal is never for any purpose to use force. The precept showing the level below which we cannot fall is that of returning good for evil, being patient under wrong, giving the cloak also. That is the fourth command. The ideal is to love the enemies who hate us. The precept showing the level below which we cannot fall is not to do evil to our enemies, to speak well of them, and to make no difference between them and our neighbors. All these precepts are indications of what, on our journey to perfection, we are ready, fully able to avoid, and what we must labor to attain now, and what we ought by degrees to translate into instinctive and unconscious habits. But these precepts, far from constituting the whole of Christ's teaching and exhausting it, are simple stages on the way to perfection. These precepts must and will be followed by higher and higher precepts on the way to perfection held up by the religion. And therefore, it is essentially a part of the Christian religion to make demands higher than those expressed in its precepts, and by no means to diminish the demands either of the ideal itself or of the precepts, as people imagine who judge it from the standpoint of the social conception of life. So much for one misunderstanding of the scientific men in relation to the import and aim of Christ's teaching. Another misunderstanding arising from the same source consists in substituting love for men, the service of humanity, for the Christian principles of love for God and His service. The Christian doctrine to love God and serve Him, and only as a result of that love to love and serve one's neighbor, seems to scientific men obscure, mystic, and arbitrary. And they would absolutely exclude the obligation of love and service of God holding that the doctrine of love for men, for humanity alone, is far more clear, tangible, and reasonable. Scientific men teach in theory that the only good and rational life is that which is devoted to the service of the whole of humanity. That is for them the import of the Christian doctrine, and to that they reduce Christ's teaching. They seek confirmation of their own doctrine in the gospel on the supposition that the two doctrines are really the same. This idea is an absolutely mistaken one. The Christian doctrine has nothing in common with the doctrine of the positivists, communists, and all the apostles of the universal brotherhood of mankind, based on the general advantage of such a brotherhood. They differ from one another, especially in Christianity's having a firm and clear basis in the human soul, while love for humanity is only a theoretical deduction from analogy. The doctrine of love for humanity alone is based on the social conception of life. The essence of the social conception of life consists in the transference of the aim of the individual life to the life of societies of individuals, family, clan, tribe, or state. This transference is accomplished easily and naturally in its earliest forms, in the transference of the aim of life from the individual to the family and the clan. The transference to the tribe or the nation is more difficult and requires special training, and the transference of the sentiment to the state is the furthest limit which the process can reach. To love oneself is natural to everyone, and no one needs any encouragement to do so. To love one's clan, who support and protect one, to love one's wife, the joy and help of one's existence, one's children, the hope and consolation of one's life, and one's parents who has given one life and education, is natural. And such love, though far from being so strong as love of self, is met with pretty often. To love, for one's own sake, through personal pride, one's tribe, one nation, though not so natural, is nevertheless common. Love of one's own people, who are of the same blood, the same tongue, and the same religion as oneself is possible though far from being so strong as love of self, or even love of family or clan. But love for a state, such as Turkey, Germany, England, Austria, or Russia, is a thing almost impossible. And though it is zealously inculcated, it is only an imagined sediment. It has no existence in reality. 
At that limit, man's power of transferring his interest ceases, and he cannot feel any direct sentiment for that fictitious entity. The positivist, however, and all the apostles of fraternity on scientific principles, without taking into consideration the weakening of sentiment in proportion to the extension of its object, draw further deductions in theory in the same direction. Since, they say, it was for the advantage of the individual to extend his personal interest to the family, the tribe, and subsequently to the nation and the state, it would be still more advantageous to extend his interest in societies of men to the whole of mankind, and so all to live for humanity, just as men live for the family or the state. Theoretically it follows, indeed, having extended the love and interest for the personality to the family, the tribe, and thence to the nation and the state, it would be perfectly logical for men to save themselves the strife and calamities which result from the division of mankind into nations and states, by extending their love to the whole of humanity. This would be most logical, and theoretically, nothing would appear more natural to its advocates, who do not observe that love is a sentiment which may or may not be felt, but which is useless to advocate. And moreover, that love must have an object, and that humanity is not an object. It is nothing but a fiction. The family, the tribe, even the state were not invented by men, but formed themselves spontaneously, like anthills or swarms of bees, and have a real existence. The man, who for the sake of his own animal personality, loves his family, knows whom he loves, Anna, Dolly, John, Peter, and so on. The man who loves his tribe and takes pride in it, knows that he loves all the gulfs or all the hillbillies. The man who loves the state knows that he loves France bounded by the Rhine and the Pyrenees and its principal city Paris and its history and so on. But the man who loves humanity, what does he love? There is such a thing as a state, as a nation. There is the abstract conception of man. But humanity as a concrete idea does not and cannot exist. Humanity. Where is the definition of humanity? Where does it end and where does it begin? Does humanity end with the savage, the idiot, the dipsomaniac, or the madman? If we draw a line excluding from humanity its lowest representatives, where are we to draw the line? Shall we exclude the Negroes like the Americans, or the Hindus like some Englishmen, or the Jews like some others? If we include all men without exception, why should we not include also higher animals? many of whom are superior to the lowest specimens of the human race. We know nothing of humanity as an eternal object, and we know nothing of its limits. Humanity is a fiction, and it is impossible to love it. It would doubtless be very advantageous if men could love humanity just as they love their family. It would be very advantageous, as communists advocate, to replace the competitive, individualistic organization of men's activity by a social universal organization, so that each would be for all and all for each. Only there is no motive to lead men to do this. The positivists, the communists, and all the apostles of fraternity on scientific principles advocate the extension to the whole of humanity of the love men feel for themselves, their family, and the state. They forget that the love which they are discussing is a personal love which might expand in a rarefied form to embrace a man's native country, but which disappears before it can embrace an artificial state such as Austria, England, or Turkey, and which we cannot even conceive of in relation to all humanity, an absolutely mystic conception. A man loves himself, his animal personality. He loves his family. He even loves his native country. Why should he not love humanity? That would be such an excellent thing. And by the way, it is precisely what is taught by Christianity. So think the advocates of positivist, communistic, or socialistic fraternity. It would indeed be an excellent thing, but it can never be. For the love that is based on a personal or social conception of life can never rise beyond love for the state. The fallacy of the argument lies in the fact that the social conception of life on which love for family and nation is founded, rests itself on love of self, and that love grows weaker and weaker as it is extended from self to family, tribe, nationality, and state. And in the state, 
we reach the furthest limit beyond which it cannot go. The necessity of extending the fear of love is beyond dispute. But in reality, the possibility of this love is destroyed by the necessity of extending its object indefinitely, and thus the insufficiency of personal human love is made manifest. And here advocates of positivist, communistic, socialistic fraternity propose to draw upon Christian love to make up the default of this bankrupt human love. But Christian love only in its results, not in its foundations. They propose love for humanity alone, apart from the love for God. But such a love cannot exist. There is no motive to produce it. Christian love is the result only of the Christian conception of life, in which the aim of life is to love and serve God. The social conception of life has led men, by a natural transition from love of self and then of family, tribe, nation, and state, to a conscientiousness of the necessity of love for humanity, a conception which has no definite limits and extends to all living things. And this necessity for love of what awakens no kind of sentiment in a man is a contradiction which cannot be solved by the social theory of life. The Christian doctrine in its full significance can alone solve it by giving a new meaning to life. Christianity recognizes love of self, of family, of nation, and of humanity, and not only of humanity, but of everything living, everything existing. It recognizes the necessity of an infinite extension of the sphere of love. But the object of this love is not found outside self in societies of individuals, nor in the external world but within self, in the divine self, whose essence is that very love which the animal self is brought to feel the need of through its consciousness of its own perishable nature. The difference between the Christian doctrine and those which preceded it is that the social doctrine said, live in opposition to your nature, understanding by this only the animal nature. Make it subject to the external law of family, society, and state. Christianity says, Live according to your nature, understanding by this the divine nature. Do not make it subject to anything, neither you, an animal self, nor that of others, and you will attain the very aim to which you are striving when you subject your external self. The Christian doctrine brings a man to the elementary consciousness of self, not only of the animal self, but of the divine self, the divine spark, the self as son of God as much God as the Father himself, though confined in an animal husk. The consciousness of being the Son of God, whose chief characteristic is love, satisfies the need for the extension of the sphere of love to which the man of social conception of life has been brought. For the latter, the welfare of the personality demanded an ever-widening extension of the sphere of love. Love was a necessity and was confined to certain objects, self, family, society. With the Christian conception of life, love is not a necessity and is confined to no object. It is the essential faculty of the human soul. Man loves not because it is in his interest to love this or that, but because love is the essence of his soul, because he cannot but love. The Christian doctrine shows man that the essence of his soul is love, that his happiness depends not on loving this or that object, but on loving the principle of the whole, God, whom he recognizes within himself as love, and therefore he loves all things and all men. And this is the fundamental difference between the Christian doctrine and the doctrine of the positivist and all the theorizers about universal brotherhood on non-Christian principles. Such are the two principal misunderstandings relating to the Christian religion from which the greater number of false reasonings about it proceed. The first consists in the belief that Christ's teaching instructs men, like all previous religions, by rules, which they are bound to follow, and these rules cannot be fulfilled. The second is the idea that the whole purport of Christianity is to teach men to live advantageously together as one family, and to attain this, that we need only to follow the rule of love to humanity, dismissing all thought of love of God altogether. The mistaken notion of scientific men that the essence of Christianity consists in the supernatural and that its moral teachings is impractical 
constitutes another reason of the failure of men of the present day to understand Christianity. We hope you enjoyed this interesting audio title. For more information on all of our titles, please visit us at thoughtaudio.com.